Dr. Sennett, do you want to start in one minute? Sure. Okay, whenever you're ready, the attendance looks good. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carrie Ann Van Nostrum, an associate professor and an expert in interventional pulmonary medicine. Uh, this area is a subject of so much progress from bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, robotic bronchoscopy, cryobiopsies, uh, bronchial thermoplasties, it's literally exploded. And what she's going to do is go through today and bring us up to date on all, some of these new techniques. I think this will be one of the most interesting grand rounds of the year. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Van Nostrum. Tell us about the new frontiers. We're excited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinnott, and it's uh, great to see everyone. Um, I've got a great crew here with me, and they promised that they would laugh at all of my jokes, um, so uh, I appreciate them doing that. So that's correct. We're going to talk about things that are on the horizon for interventional pulmonary. I have nothing to disclose. But I do want to start off with our first disclosure. So IP, kind of a common acronym that we're all not supposed to use, but co coming out of COVID, I think often it gets confused with infection prevention. So just as a disclaimer, we will be not talking, we will not be talking about any infection prevention, but we will be talking about interventional pulmonary. Things that we're going to talk about are determining the things that interventional pulmonologists diagnose and treat. We're going to also talk about things uh, that are options for patients with chronic bronchitis talking about um, treatment options that we have endoscopically for COPD associated with hyperinflation, and then identify endoscopic therapies for the treatment of peripheral lung cancers. So first we're gonna start, what is interventional pulmonary, and then go through all of these things. So a lot of times when I tell people I'm an interventional pulmonologist, I get a blank stare. So I kind of had to sit back and think, hmm, I wonder what that is and what do people think I do? So I actually said, what does my dog think I do at work? I'm pretty sure my dog thinks I cheat with all of the pet therapy animals here and that I come home smelling like something else. My son, who's still nursing, probably thinks I come to work and make milk because that's what I come home with. So I'm pretty sure he thinks that I just go to the farm. My husband, I think he thinks I spend a lot of time on Teams. And some of the new technology that we have actually looks like arcade games. So he also thinks I play golden tea at work. So for those of you that know what that is, but what I actually do, I actually spend a lot of time in the bronchoscopy suite, and this can also be done in the operating room or even just in endoscopy. But really what I do is wear scrubs pretty much every day and talk to people about their airways. So interventional pulmonology, it's a maturing medical subspecialty within the field of pulmonary medicine. It deals specifically with minimally invasive endoscopic techniques, as well as percutaneous procedures for the diagnosis treatment of malignant and non-malignant processes of the airways, lungs, and pleura. So you're probably like, hmm, basically the chest. But if we break that down, these are all of the things that in a one-year subspecialty that an interventional pulmonary fellow learns how to do. And we break this into plural, non-malignant, malignant, malignant um, as well as diagnosis and staging. So a lot to go over, but the things we're going to talk about are what's up and coming that aren't really on this slide, on, on this slide specifically. So we're continuing to add. So we're going to start with the endoscopic management of COPD and chronic bronchitis. It's not news to anyone that COPD impacts a lot of our patients, right? It's the third leading cause of death worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. 
It also causes a large burden of disease with an increased cost and a decreased quality of life. <clears throat> There's currently no effective cure for it, and we really focus on symptom management. We also have to take into account that we probably underestimate the disease. We probably aren't thinking of everybody that comes in with dyspnea as having COPD. And over the next several years, we're going to see more and more patients with COPD. There's estimates that in the coming 10 years that just COPD alone will cost the U.S. somewhere between 60 and $100 billion of healthcare dollars. So what do we have in our arsenal currently? Well, a lot of you know this slide. The busy one on the left are all of the inhalers and medications that you can give. It's a bit like alphabet soup. And this is really the first line for a lot of our patients, right? But it drives a lot of the cost. And often you have to remember, it doesn't fix the problem, right? COPD is a loss of alveolar spaces, right? So if I give you an inhaler and think that that's gonna replace your alveoli, that's pretty silly, right? So when we give patients inhalers and they come back and say, I don't feel any different, it makes sense, right? But they also struggle with that because they don't feel better. Why did we give them something that doesn't make them feel better, but often costs a fair amount of money? So, you know, I think those are areas where when we think about where the endoscopic approach really can get big bang for their buck is that we're really kind of treating some of that physiology, that pathophysiology to make patients really feel better. We're not necessarily reversing the destruction, but we're trying to change their physiology to make it better. So. Basically, if you look at the current gold 2023 guidelines. For patients that have symptoms of dyspnea that are moderate to severe, so meaning they're on maximal medical therapy with inhalers, we've talked to them about tobacco cessation, we've talked to them about pulmonary rehab, there are additional options that patients can undergo. So what can we do with a bronchoscope? Well, here are some of the things that we can do, and we classify these as endoscopic lung volume reduction. So basically, we're going to do procedures where we take the really bad lung and kind of compress it, get rid of it. While it stays in the chest physiolog stays in the chest um, there, we are actually making it non-physiologic, right? So we want the good lung to work better and kind of remove the bad lung from the situation. So things that we have in our toolbox to do this are endobronchial valves. And we'll spend a bit of our time talking about that because that is where the most data comes from. It's also the most available throughout institutions. But other things that exist are lung uh, volume reduction coils, thermal vapor ablation, which if you ask me telling someone that I'm going to vaporize their airway sounds a little scary, um, lung sealants, and also airway bypass, bypass stenting. So these are the things that we can talk about. So how do we decide which therapy is best? Well, it's a combination of things. One, it's about making sure that they're on optimal medical therapy. It's about what their emphysema looks like on a CAT scan. Is it the same in every lobe? Is it distributed differently? So is it homogeneous? It looks the same everywhere. Or is it heterogeneous? It looks different in different places. And then also, what does the fissure look like? So I know we always love to go back to anatomy and think about the fissures, but the fissure is important, right? The fissure is what separ separates the lobes from each other. And a complete fissure, that means that they don't communicate at all, but an incomplete fissure means that there can be communication of the airway. And I'm not going to quiz you on this later. You've all taken your step one and probably had a question on this, but it's important when we think about the therapies to think about this collateral ventilation. It happens in three ways. So there's three ways that in an incomplete fissure that air can move from one lobe to the other. So it can move in the interbronchial channel, so bronchi to bronchi, a bronchi to an alveoli, or an alveolus to an alveolus. So as we go through and look at the options that we're talking about with a bronchoscope, think about what's actually going on in the lung and how this may actually impact what we can offer, okay? This is what we go through with the patients in the office. So endobronchial valves, you can see here, I'm gonna get my laser pointer here. Um, it's a unidirectional valve that's implanted into the airway. So by doing this, we isolate all of the, um, bronchi that supply an entire lobe. And the goal of that is actually to cause no airflow into the lobe itself. So when the patient inhales, the valve is pulled against the airway wall so that air swirls around and doesn't enter that lobe. 
But it also comes with the fact that when the patient exhales, that trapped air within that lobe can actually escape. So the goal of this is to basically create complete lobar atelectasis. So what do we know about all of this? So we talked about those fissures, right? And then this is one of those where if you have collateral ventilation, it's not going to be something that's helpful, right? If air can go into another lobe and backfill the lobe that you've blocked off, it's not going to be effective. So it's important for patients coming in for endobronchial valves that we know they don't have collateral ventilation. And there are a couple of ways we can do that. We do that with the CT itself, but we also get a report from the company. So we do a dedicated CT that has specific parameters, and then it goes to the company and they give us a report back. And it tells us two things. It tells us the amount of destruction based on the Hounsfield units. So how much COPD is in the lobe that we're targeting, it tells us the completeness of the fissure, so how likely we are to completely block the lobe. And then it also gives us an idea of what the volume of air is within that lobe, because we want to decrease that lobe and let other lobes do the work. So we have to know that. So once we know this and we determine that the patient's a candidate, we can bring them in for a bronchoscopy. We give, do this under general anesthesia. We size the airways and then we place the valves. After that, what we expect for our patients is that they're going to have an improved health status. So their BODE scores are actually better. They have improved quality of life and exercise based on our COPD metrics, as well as six minute walk distance. They have an improved breathlessness. They actually have improved lung function. So we actually see reduction um, of the, the air trapping and improvement in the FEV1. And then this all is on the caveat that you have successful lober occlusion. If we don't completely collapse the lobe, then the patients don't feel better. And that makes sense because we didn't do what we set out to do. So as we place valves and you start to see patients in the hospital, there's going to be some things about post-valve care. So patients that undergo valves, um, they're recommended that they stay in the hospital for a minimum of three days. And the reason that we're worried about that, can anybody think? I'll tell you. What we worry about when we create lobar collapse is uncoupling of the parietal from the visceral pleura and creating a pseudo pneumothorax, right? so that the patient feels short of breath because the lung can't hyperinflate to accommodate that space. And so a lot of these patients within the first 72 hours may require a chest tube placement to help facilitate um, the, the lobar, um, the expansion so that the patients can feel better. So all patients have to have a chest tube with them at all times as they travel through the hospital. So if you're tasked with taking care of one of these patients, that chest tube should be with them all times. They have their own bag with their own name on it. It goes everywhere with them. We're starting to realize that within the first post-op procedure day, so that first 24 hours, that we're recommending bed rest and antitussives um, and also not recommending any um, necessarily, you know, inhalers or incentive spirometry. What we're trying to do is avoid drastic changes in the pleural pressure that can place patients at risk of having this uncoupling of the pleura. Um, we also, once we've been successful or if we start to see the uncoupling, there's a couple of things we do. We can place the chest tube. If we're not seeing things are better, then sometimes we take the patients back to actually revise the valves. And that means either removal or replacement or resizing of that at the same time. Other things, once we have our patients that have valves, we see them in the office very frequently, three, six, 12 months, to make sure that that atelectasis is continuing. Because sometimes what we'll see is with continued cough and uh, normal respirations that those valves can move and that movement can require a revision later on. So we do kind of still follow these patients even though the intervention may be done. So moving on to coils, and I promise this is a whirlwind, so bear with us, <laughs> lung volume reduction coils. Um, it's a pretty neat technology, um, and this can be done with um, either homogeneous or even heterogeneous emphysema um, associated with hyperinflation, but they can't have any findings of chronic bronchitis or bronchiectasis. And as we go through what valves look like going in, that will make a little bit more sense. But usually we place about 10 valves per lobe, and we then come back and do the contralateral side one to three months later. Usually patients stay overnight. Again, we're worried about pneumothorax, but also these patients tend to have a bit of hemoptysis. You can imagine that putting in a coil and then putting in this straight wire and then having it coil back can lead to some hemoptysis. But basically these are made out of nitinol. Um, it's deployed in a straight line and then it recovers to its original coil shape. 
And basically what we do is we take the diseased tissue, coil that around the coil, and then pull that in centrally. So we create atelectasis that way. So we'll go through one of these so you can see what we're talking about. So this is done under uh, flor fluoroscopy. So we have our, our bronchoscope, our flexible bronchoscope in a segment here. We send out a catheter and then we continue to watch that and send out the catheter, send out a wire, and then send out our coil and hold that into place. We repeat that about 10 times so that at the end, we get something like this. And all of those coils are pulling in that diseased airway to allow the more healthy lung to hyperinflate around it. So what does this look like before and after? So before, so you can see the before here. So this is the immediate post-op period. You can see that the coils are here in both upper lobes. And then over time, as they continue to pull and create atelectasis, you see that the fissures move up and the normal lung is allowed to hyperinflate around it. And so this is something that we would consider to be a very good success. We also seem to note, um, and again, this is a bit observational, but the patients that tend to get an inflammatory response, they have hemoptysis, they have a post-op fever, a little bit of like a COPD exacerbation, tends to give us a hint that there's more inflammation and that inflammation really helps that atelectatic area kind of seal and stick together. So we find that, you know, even though that's something that may seem counterintuitive as helpful, it does seem to really help the patients do well. Uh, physiologically, when we look at metrics, um, we do see that there are a few randomized control trials, but again, we do know that there's improvement in the FEV1, the decrease in the residual volume, improvement in the six-minute walk distance, and their St. George respiratory questionnaire actually gets better. So not only do we see these things radiographically, the patients also feel these. What's a little bit hard is that we don't always know how long this is going to last, right? So these are still newer technologies. So we don't know at three, six, 10 years how this will impact any of the patients. So we are undergoing those current studies, but we're not quite there yet. So that brings us to thermal vapor ablation. Um, this is a technology where we will, in one here, we isolate the bronchus. We then take a catheter and place that into the bronchus. We then inflate a balloon because we don't want any of the vapor leaking into areas that we don't want to treat, right? So we want to isolate it. And then we deliver hot steam for about three to 10 seconds. And then we repeat that throughout the lobe. Usually the procedure time is about 30 minutes, give or take a little bit. And basically we destroy the part of the upper lobes that are most, or we're targeting the most destroyed areas. And this heated, heated water is intended to induce that inflammatory response, right? And then that leads to parenchymal fibrosis. And so what this looks like radiographically at the end is that you can see pre-thermal -therm ablation, you can see our fissure here, diseased lung here. It undergoes the vapor. The lung is now atelectatic here, and this is the fissure. So we've moved the fissure, created atelectasis, and gotten what we wanted where we can actually use the other lung to kind of help the patient feel better. So we're combating those effects of hyperinflation through this. There's currently only one randomized control trial and no follow-up past one year. So it's not something that we reach for, but just like all of medicine, we won't ever be surprised if things circle back. Um, in fact, valves actually started, um, they didn't make FDA clearance initially, um, and then now they're back. So I, I do think some of these things will recycle and that we may be back to doing them again. Vapor trials, they also have improvement in the amount of reduction, decrease in uh, residual volume, improvement in FEV1, and then improvement in six minute walk and decrease in uh, respiratory questionnaires. So these are all improvement. How does this compare to regional um, occlusion? So this is our, our sealants and sealants. Basically what we do is we identify the area of low bar disease that we're treating. We put a catheter in and then we flush the airway to get out any of the mucus and then instill um, a glue. So you can see here that this is the catheter here instilling the glue. When we're done, there's a little plug here and that keeps the air from going in. And then over time, our chest x-ray goes from this to these areas that have been sealed off. So these are basically polymers 
um, usually use the upper lobes, um, and it helps to induce remodeling and scar formation, therefore leading to atelectasis and reducing hyperinflation. The trials that we're looking at this were terminated early, so this isn't something that we commonly do, um, but it is something that is available. Um, and, you know, again, we'll see if it comes back, but it does exist. And you may have had patients that have undergone this. So airway bypass, what this is, you can see this video here, and this is basically where we will, within a bronchus, punch a needle. So this is a catheter where that's going to have a needle, and we're going to put that needle through the airway wall. So the needle goes through the airway wall here. We'll then follow this by bringing a balloon into it to stretch that hole. You can see our pinhole here. We're going to put a balloon through there and stretch this. And what we're trying to do is create a pathway for the diseased, kind of that hyperinflated, destructed um, alveolar spaces. We're creating a pathway for it to drain into the natural airway. So we balloon this up here. And then what we will do is actually place a small stent here. So now you can see this, this uh, artificial airway that we've created, intentionally, I promise. And here we are with a catheter, and there's the stent. Here it comes. You can see the stent that we've created. So this is bypassing the natural airway that we have. You can see the stent sitting right here. And when we look into the stent, you can see the dilated airway sacs past it. So we've given the airway a different place or pathway to go. This isn't something that we do very commonly. What we found when we did this was that a lot of these valves migrated. So not surprisingly, people would get calls and say, hey doc, I coughed this thing out and it was their valve. So it's not working very well at that point. But a lot of them also got clogged with secretions. Um, and even though they tried to have um, some of these stents get embedded with um, different agents, it, it really didn't um, keep them from getting clogged with mucus. So it's not something that we commonly use anymore because it wasn't as successful as we wanted. Um, but another method that in the right patient could be potentially considered. So what does this all look like to kind of summarize this? So our patients with COPD that are on optical, optimal medical management that have symptomatic hyperinflation, right? Um, if we get their CAT scan and notice that they have homogeneous emphysema and they have high tissue destruction, we don't really have any endobronchial options. That might be a time to consider lung transplantation in the correct patient. If they have moderate destruction, we start to think about coils. And then if they have heterogeneous, we really assess for whether or not they have collateral ventilation by the fissures. If they don't, really that's where most people are putting in endobronchial valves. And if they don't, if they do have collateral ventilation, we really think about sealants, vapor, and coils in those patients. Um, so I think things that you can add to your toolbox, maybe outside of inhalers and things to think about um, with some of your patients. But how does this compare to chronic bronchitis, right? So hyperinflation and chronic bronchitis are different, different symptoms, right? So when we think about chronic bronchitis, those patients are telling us they have a ton of mucus production, lots of exacerbations, and those are things that really impact their quality of life. And this is a group that I think we're really excited in interventional pulmonary to be able to provide um, some relief because these patients use a fair amount of, of resources and feel pretty bad. So what are the tools that we have that are coming down the pipeline? So things for chronic bronchitis or frequent exacerbations, we can do something called bronchial rayoplasty, and we'll go over what that is, metered cryospray, balloon desobstruction, and targeted lung denervation. So these are other things that we can do with a bronchoscope. I know you guys thought we just did BALs, right? Um, so bronchial rayoplasty, the theory behind it is that chronic bronchitis is related to the goblet cell hyper, hyperplasia that creates um, this kind of this mucus. And what we deliver is a high frequency electrical energy to actually destroy the epithelium. 
And then we allow time for the airway to regenerate, and then it will regenerate without that pre-existing metaplasia. So how do we do bronchial rhioplasty? So cartoon assessment. So we have our patient who's asleep. Usually we do this under general anesthesia, so people don't look at us with their eyes wide open when we do this. Um, but the bronchoscope goes down. We have a special catheter that will go in. At the end of the catheter, we see our bronchoscope here. The catheter comes out and you'll see this mesh structure. We inflate that mesh so that it comes in contact with the entire airway wall circumferentially. And we deliver this high frequency energy really to destroy these goblet cells. You can see that's what we're doing. I promise in the Bronx suite, it's like not this satisfying because you can't see to this degree. We allow the basement membrane extracellular matrix that actually remains intact without any destruction. Goblet cells go away. And then when they regenerate, they don't look like the yucky ones that are causing pollution. They actually turn out to be ones that are healthy. So that's how that works. So in theory, the cartoon is nice, but what does it actually look like bronchoscopically? So on the left here, we have a patient uh, pre-treatment. You can see that the, the mucosa is a little bit baggy, kind of um, edematous, but you can see there's just these boogers throughout. No very scientific word, booger, but we do use that in the lab. Um, and you can see that that's all around. About a month after the rhioplasty, you don't see any of those secretions. You see a little bit of the mucosa. It actually looks a little bit healthier. It's not quite as swollen and inflamed. And so that's something that really um, makes us feel satisfied. But what they did in one of the original studies is not only did they look at what it looked like, they actually did biopsies of the endothelium. And when they compared that, so pre rhioplasty up here at top at A, you can see all this blue stuff. This is all of the mucus and the goblet cells. And then 120 days later after the rhioplasty, they came back and biopsied the same areas. And you can see that we don't see that goblet cell hyperplasia, right? So we're not um, seeing that amount of inflammation, mucus production, um, and potentially even the amount of airway responsiveness. So this is new. We are um, currently undergoing trials in the US that are due to close in the next little bit. So this is something that we foresee definitely being available to patients here in the US. So we're pretty excited about this. How does that compare to cryospray? Well, cryospray, the idea is that we flash freeze liquid nitrogen to minus 196 Celsius, which causes basically instant cell death by rushing water into the cell and causing apoptosis. And then while we do that, it only goes to a certain depth and that depth allows preservation of the extracellular matrix. And then that intact extracellular matrix enables healing with limited scarring and fibrosis. So again, similar way, we destroy kind of those goblet cells, that hyperplasia, and allow for regeneration without that. Cryospray is delivered a little bit differently. So we have a system here. So this is our liquid nitrogen here. It has a catheter that comes through our bronchoscope, and then it comes out of the tube. And then what we do is with the system here, it will tell us the airways that we're going to deliver. And it's very much programmed so that um, each session is, is very um, standardized so that we can make sure we deliver the same amount to all of the airways. So this allows for kind of that circumferential cryo um, spray. So all of the airway gets the same amount. Um, we destroy with the cryo to about a depth of 0.1 to half millimeter um, and can kind of go at a width of about 10 millimeters. So we want to treat pretty much all of the airways we can see. This one's done in three treatment sessions. So we do the right lower lobe, the right main stem bronchus, come back four to six weeks later, do the left lower lobe, left main stem bronchus, give them another four to six weeks off, and then come back and treat both upper lobes. And so with this, what we find is that a lot of patients don't have serious adverse events, really not seeing a lot of pneumothorax, not a lot of hemoptysis. Um, and patients generally go home the same day with this. Um, and again, we also see that we have that complete re-epithelialization at the treatment site without that hyperplasia, but also the advantage kind of over some of the thermal or meaning like those uh, electrical energies 
that cryospray tends to be a little bit more benign to the non-diseased tissue. So we don't see as many erosions, inflammation, necrosis, or even airway stenoses that we can see sometimes with the rhyoplasty. It's also nice because when we treat the main stem bronchi, cryospray doesn't, it works by principles of the water content of the area that you're treating and cartilage doesn't have any water. So we actually don't damage the cartilage, which is a really important thing when we start talking about um, ablative techniques or other things um, to try to help patients with chronic bronchitis. So again, I think these are things that are coming down the pipeline, but we're all very excited about the balloon um, disobstruction, pretty limited data, but the idea is that if you didn't happen to have a radioplasty generator, so to generate that electrical frequency, you didn't have cryospray, is it possible that you could still get this kind of um, destruction of the goblet cells by just actually taking a balloon and inflating it multiple times and kind of disrupting it? Can you actually create that same generation? So that's the principle of this is that they use a latex balloon has a mesh structure over it. You put it into the airways as much as you can see. You inflate it multiple times um, and then using a, a small pump to actually make sure that you apply the same amount of pressure. And ideally, this results in mechanical alteration of the mucosal layer and that destruction of the goblet cells. Um, we do see improvement in lung function um, and oxygen saturation. Um, this isn't ready for prime time. I think this is still in animal, animal models and kind of in single center trials, not necessarily randomized yet. But I do think that this is something that we may also see. Um, and as we are always um, evaluating things for cost, this is something that's probably not as costly as the other two more modalities. So things to consider. So we've gone over chronic bronchitis. We're going to talk about this group of people in the middle, those chronic is chronic um, COPD that has exacerbations. So one thing that we can offer them is targeted lung denervation, which sounds really fancy. And you're probably like, hmm, that seems complicated, right? But we do all of this through a bronchoscope, so it's pretty cool. Um, so the idea here is that the parasympathetic airway nerves mediate the smooth muscle tone, mucus secretion, and airway hyperreactivity. You can see that the nerves are wrapped around the airways and that this is really how our anticholinergic inhalers work. So um, your um, anti-muscarinics, this is really the same pathway. But the idea here is that with a bronchoscope in the airway, it has a system here and that with ch chilled water basically going through the catheter, um, this radio frequency is used in both the mainstem bronchi to circumferentially ablate the parasympathetic vagal fibers innervating the lung. So the idea is that we'll reduce the bronchoconstrictive effects, the mucus production, as well as the inflammatory effect on the airway. Um, this is something that is currently undergoing trials in the U.S. Um, we call it Airflow 3. We're catching up to cardiology with fun names for our studies. Um, but the idea here is that um, by doing this, we not only reduce the risk of exacerbations of people with COPD, but we also can increase the time to the first exacerbation. So it makes a big deal if you're someone that's coming in the hospital every three months, you can get this procedure and then maybe not be coming back for one hospitalization or be looking at not having an exacerbation for six to 12 months after the procedure. Um, so I think something that um, I'm excited to see um, and see how this will, will ultimately play out. The Airflow 3 is um, comparing this to sham, so meaning that patients are undergoing this but um, not actually having the procedure. Um, and I think that, interestingly, even with the sham procedure, there's no different in safety events, so that's important. But we will see how this, how this all plays out. So for chronic bronchitis, when we think about the options that we have for patients, um, we can do the vagal nerve ablation. So meaning that we get rid of that, uh, the centers for the parasympathetic tone. We can cryospray so we can, we can freeze it, right? Get rid of it. We can do the bronchial rhyoplasty where we do the electrical frequency. So we kind of give heat therapy. Or we can do the balloon disobstruction where we actually do mechanical force uh, to kind of beat back this goblet cell hyperplasia. So you're probably asking, that's all pretty cool, but when when would I send somebody to you, right? When, when do we need to seize people? Um, so we're always happy to see anybody. 
Um, but for those that have moderate to se severe, severe COPD um, and relatively stable disease on maximal medical therapy, this is the time to really consider endoscopic techniques. Um, and I think that right now, um, we've seen a lot of patients actually reach out to us because they're part of networks or advertising on TV and they find us other ways. Um, but we can significantly help people. So we're more than happy to see anybody or talk to you about these um, for any patients that you have. So enough about COPD. Talk about switch gears for the, the second half of the talk and talk about how we can use our other technologies. Um, so endobronchial ultrasound, which we abbreviate to eBus, um, to look at peripheral lesions and even lung cancers and what we have to offer there. A lot of this is mostly in, in animal models, but things to definitely consider. So eBus or endobronchial ultrasound, um, it's a technology that's really expanded the role of pulmonologists in the diagnosis and management of lung cancer. Prior to endobronchial ultrasound, we didn't really manage a lot of lung cancer, but this is similar to EUS in that our camera has an ultrasound probe at the end. And when it touches the airway wall, we get a print, we get a view on our screen that looks like this. So we're able to actually see the lymphatic structures, the lung, or even the vascular structures, and then biopsy those lymph nodes in real time. So it's been really helpful for patients for staging um, and uh, kind of has decreased the amount of media stenoscopy. But things within that that we see coming down the pipeline are smaller diameter scopes, because right now the size of the scope kind of limits where we can place it. Um, and I think if we can get smaller diameters, we're gonna be going further and further out into the lung. So those smaller nodules that we're really gonna try to go after in real time while we can see it. We're also expanding the instrumentation behind just kind of the standard needle. So you see the needle here and we're expanding those tools, but we're also looking at delivering even chemotherapy and other techniques actually through the needles themselves to kind of help um, patients with cancer. So some things that are also coming. So one, go back, got happy with the clicking there. So this is actually a special needle that actually freezes when you put it in the lymph node. So you puncture the lymph node, you freeze it, and then you pull out a little popsicle of lymph node. And you're probably like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. But one of the issues that we run into when we're biopsying needles with fine needle aspiration is that it's really hard when we get into some of the lymphomas where we want more tissue or more structure. And so this allows us to give patients more tissue without actually having to necessarily do surgery. Additionally, so this is a special needle that does that, but in interventional pulmonology, we believe in being MacGyvers. And so in case you didn't have this needle, we all have cryoprobes. And so basically what we've done is that we find, find the lymphatic tissue that's enlarged. We use our EBUS. We use the needle here to actually create a small pathway through the airway mucosa. And then through that, this little hole here, we take the cryoprobe we already have and put it through there and actually freeze the lymph node in real time while we're watching it without a needle, and then pull out a small chunk here. Um, what we normally get are kind of ribbons. They're kind of these fine strings. And so this is really helpful to our pathologists who always want more tissue. Um, my uncle's a pathologist and I always tell him you have enough, but he says we don't have enough. So um, this is really important. Um, and a lot more of our colleagues are really doing this. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we have to be careful, of course, if we're shoving things through the airway and not shoving, but, you know, it, introducing larger equipment is bleeding, right? And then also creating pneumothoraces or pneumomediastinum. So it's important to make sure that those um, things are not happening. Um, other things, so we talked about uh, biopsying, but there's also the opportunity to deliver therapeutics. So this is the idea of actually taking that EBUS needle and injecting uh, e uh, chemotherapy for control of recurrent non-small cell lung cancer in, in a nodal space. So as we inject, we start to see this hypoechoic area that's expanding. So that's the medication that we're delivering. This can be um, cisplatin, carboplatin, basically is what we're talking about. And we can see here in this particular patient, they had nodal recurrence. They got their intralesional chemotherapy. And then at four months, there's no evidence of nodal disease there by actually putting the chemotherapy there. So smaller doses required for patients. Um, so I think things that we may be actually considering. 
Um, EBUS, again, super interesting and, you know, very, very much uh, lots of applications. But Dr. Sinnott promised I was going to talk about robotics, um, which is a new thing. But I think one of the biggest dilemmas that we face as pulmonologists and probably you all on the floor is when you get your CT scan and a patient has a nodule. And the, the real big question is, what are we going to do about it? Does anything need to be done or how are we going to get to that nodule, right? And that's really what we face too, is you know the, the outer two thirds of the lung can be very complex and a lot of our instruments may be too big or they may not necessarily be designed for it. So you can see all these things here have, have been tried, but really the big thing as we start talking about moving to the next frontier of interventional pulmonary is actually treating these potentially stage one lung cancers at the same time as we biopsy them, right? So we would bring them in, we would do their EBUS, prove that they don't have nodal disease, right? So we're saying that they're not a two or three, then actually getting to the nodule itself, proving it's cancer, and then while being there, deliver an ablative technique to actually provide cure in one setting. But it's a big challenge, right? Because not only do we have to get there, we have to get there all of the time and be very precise and very accurate. And you can see here on the right that one of our biggest things is that the airway is here and often our nodule is not anywhere near the airway. So our equipment has to be able to get there. So what came down the pipeline was robotics. And there are currently two platforms. We're not gonna kind of go into them, but the idea is that you can do one here where you have a controller and a screen or this one that my husband thinks looks like golden tea. So a different way. So um, one platform uses electromagnetic navigation. The other one uses shape sensing technology, which is the same things that are on the outside of the space shuttles for NASA. So it's the same equipment that allows the um, catheter to, to sense the shape of the airways and follow it. So this is the kind of coming frontier. We're still not quite there with that accuracy and that precision that we want, but we're getting better. And one thing that we found that has, that has helped us is not only having the robot in the room, but also adding the addition of cone beam CT. So what does that mean? That means that while we have our instruments in the patient, right, patients asleep here, we have actually a CT scanner here that will actually rotate fully around the patient. And then within the room will give us a printout of the patient so that we can make micro adjustments to our biopsy instruments in real time without having you know, to, to make small adjustments. So you can see here, this is what the fluoro looks like. The machine thinks that we're here. We do the spin with the CT. We confirm that this bright white light here is the catheter and that it's in the lesion. And while we're in the room, we actually get all of the CTs. So we get the axial coronals and sagittals and we confirm in all planes that we're where we wanna be. And then we're able to do those biopsies. But again, the goal here would be that we can actually also deliver therapeutics, but we still have to be accurate and precise. So as we can do that, we can also, while we're there, deliver brachytherapy. So radiation directly to the site through a catheter. So pretty cool. Um, and as promised, you know, I think that the, the title of this is Heat and Destroy, so Bronchoscopic Guided Therapy of Peripheral Lung Lesions. And it really is the not too distant future. Um, and I think this is going to benefit a lot of our patients that aren't surgical candidates as we see more and more lung cancer screening, right? So the NSLT showed us that we can screen for lung cancer. We recently had something come out through the American Thoracic Society, American College of Chest Physicians, that we're under screening. There are approximately 10 million people in this country that need lung cancer screening that haven't gotten their CT. That's a lot of lung nodules. That's a lot of things. And not everyone's going to be a surgical candidate. And so this is the group that actually can benefit from uh, a local therapy. So what do we have to offer? Well, we have to make sure that people are ideal candidates. So we have to deliver in a difficult to access space. We have to be able to complete the ablation in a single procedure, right? These are patients that aren't surgical candidates. Bringing them back and forth for multiple procedures kind of defeats the purpose, right? Um, we want to make sure that we treat the whole tumor without having pretty ne without having negative effects to the surrounding normal lung tissue, right? If we do microwave ablation but completely destroy the whole lobe that we were trying, then we haven't really helped. So it's important to make sure about that. 
we have to have a lower complication rate than percutaneous ablation, right? So we have to be, if we want this to work, we have to be better than interventional radiology, right? That's that's the reality, right? And also, I think that there's the theory that this can uh, generate an in vivo vaccine effect. So basically, by providing treatment to the lesion itself, that within the immune system, we can actually rev the immune system up to actually fight the tumor itself, not only there, but even at distant sites. So I think there's a lot of things that make bronchoscopy ideal. You know, IR can do this, but the concern with doing things percutaneously for IR for treatment is that, one, the risk of pneumothorax is much higher than going through the airway the chances of causing seeding of the tract, right? So you're going into a cancer with a needle, putting a catheter and taking it out. So there's a chance that you can drag some of those tumor cells with you, but also create a bronco uh, or alveolar fistula. So those are some of the side effects of doing that. So um, again, we have to think about all of those things. So what are the modalities that are on the horizons for this? So RFA or radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, Photodynamic therapy, cryotherapy, it keeps coming back, high intensity focused ultrasound, um, and then ultrasound activated nanotechnologies. But the biggest limitation that we have is the engineering of our, our equipment and getting there, right? Just like we talked about, same thing. We have to get there. We have to be accurate when we do it. So what does RFA look like? So this is um, the technology that has probably that has been around the longest um, when it comes uh, to the lung. And basically, it has a generator that produces um, alternating high-frequency current passed through the electrode into the tissue. And we're targeting about 65 to 105 degrees Celsius. And that's where we get that really nice coagulation necrosis. If we go over that, we start to see carbonization and kind of defeat the purpose of what we're doing. But again, um, this, is, this is something that we are definitely trying. There is more human data for this than some of the other modalities. Photodynamic therapy, or what we call PDT, is basically where uh, a person that has cancer gets a medication IV that's a photosensitizer. We allow that to circulate throughout the body for about 24 to 72 hours. It gets taken up in all parts of the body, but the tumor tends to hold on to it longer, which is why we have that period where we wait. And then we allow the cancer cells to absorb that. And then we go to the site of the cancer cells, and with a light, um, we expose that photosensitizer that agent to light, and that is what results in the destruction. That light causes um, the, the formation of oxygen radicals, thromboxane A2, and that's where that kind of results from. Uh, this has been applied for a, quite a while to the central airway. So what PDT looks like, you can see here, there's carcinoma in situ in the airway. We've given the patient their injection of the photoferrin. We wait, we come back with our light here. We sensitize it, and then over the next several days, we see that tissue destruction. Centrally, we usually have to go back and pick that stuff out because it just clogs the airways. But peripherally, we probably wouldn't have to do that. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see more applications of PDT for these peripheral lesions. Microwave ablation is also being considered. A lot more studies uh, in animals, uh, but this does have a few studies in people, and basically, we, um, heat is generated from electromagnetic waves. These waves oscillate, cause the water molecules to realign, and that produces heat, which reaches a, um, a cytotoxic level. Um, difference between RFA and microwave, this does have radiation into the deeper tissue. So RFA tends to be a little bit, um, we don't see as much of that destruction past where the tumor is, but microwave is not affected. Uh, by the tissue or the air around it, and the carbonization doesn't affect the ability to continue tumor destruction. So you can see here, going after this nodule here, going through their navigation to get there, confirming that with CT. They have their microwave catheter here. They have the targeted area based on their probe um, and what they're intending to, to actually microwave. They go ahead and deliver that energy. And after 20 seconds of treatment, this is what that area looks like. So you can see that that destruction has been there. We went from ground glass to microwave destruction all in one sitting. Um, we are also looking at um, cryotherapy in the periphery. 
Um, and so again, similar to the one that we talked about for chronic bronchitis, same idea, these rapid freeze uh, cycles. Um, but it's important that, again, that depth of penetration that we talk about with cryo, where it's not very deep, you may actually have to do multiple applications to the same tumor based on the, on the size. So it's quite possible that if you have a lesion, you may actually have to treat that eight to 10 times to get the amount of destruction that you're looking for. Um, and we're still really, really looking at this, but I think uh, in interventional pulmonary cryotherapy has a lot of appeal because of the lack of destruction of, of normal tissue. And that seems to appeal to a lot of us over some of the thermal techniques. So things that we have to consider when we're, when we're doing this, um, our probe has to be thin and flexible, right? We're asking it to make these tiny tight turns in the periphery of the lung. We have to have good position that needs to be confirmed throughout. Um, and you can see here on, on the right, this is what that cone beam CT allows us to see is our bronchoscope with the uh, delivery device actually in it on three, all three planes. And that's gonna be something that we wanna confirm. We wanna make sure that we're treating the area that we intend. The area of effect needs to be known and we need to cover the entire tumor and the physical conditions of the therapeutic probe. Again, sometimes we test these in normal lung and we're not necessarily testing them in tumor and those could be very different conditions for the modality. And right now we have incomplete safety information on a lot of these. We're looking at these again in normal tissue. So people are doing these in animal studies and looking at the microwave effect, you know, in healthy dog lung, but we don't know what that means in humans in diseased lung or humans with tumor. So I think there's, there's plenty to come on this. I think this is really exciting. Um, I think patients will definitely benefit um, from, from this type of, of modalities that we offer. I promised you some things on education. And I think one thing that we're excited about um, in interventional pulmonary is that we have a lot of colleagues that have been working very tirelessly um, on getting uh, interventional pulmonary to be an ACGME accredited fellowship. Um, and that application has gone in and has just gone through the review committee. So we're hoping that this will be an ACGME fellowship starting July of 2024. Um, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Makes me feel really old, though, because <laughs> um, I graduated some time ago. But I think this is really an exciting time for our field. It's going to help standardize things. I think having the educational front will help us get good quality research out there as well. Um, and really, you know, make us a field that um, people can recognize and not always confuse with um, infection prevention, right? IP will be its own. So some conclusions. Interventional pulmonary is undergoing a paradigm shift parallel to lots of other fields of medicine. Um, dramatic advances have been made in diagnosis, staging, and even treatment of thoracic malignancies, as well as uh, bronchitis. And these diagnostic and therapeutic uh, modalities um, are sure to help patients with lung cancer, chronic bronchitis, and even emphysema. So I will thank you all for your time and attention. And a mentor of mine always said that you should always put your children in your talks. So I say the future is bright and exciting. I included both. I have one that has fur and one that does not. So they're both here. So I will uh, again say thank you for everyone's time and open it up for any questions. Decide where to place these five. What an excellent so. job. Thank you. Thank you. How do we decide where to place the, the bypasses? Um, so it's really where we're trying to identify the areas of the most destruction and then bring that to a more central airway. So we're looking for a lobar or a main stem bronchus, basically. Is there anybody? Dr. Michaud? Uh, Carrie Ann, one of the other nice advantages with some of these peripheral, um, these peripheral uh, modalities is that what we found is that we are able to do things like give immunotherapy in very low doses, particularly in patients that actually have very high risk of developing like pneumonitis from their from their um, interstitial lung disease or their very severe COPD. So patients that have either interstitial lung disease that's severe or COPD tend to fare very poorly with um, with toxicities from immune therapies, which are sort of the mainstay now of lung cancer management. 
And so uh, what we found in a study that we were working on in New York is that we could actually markedly reduce the amount of immunotherapy, but we got a systemic response when we actually inject it into the lesion and then use another. So we kind of sensitized the lesion with the immunotherapy and then gave them um, regular treatment. So whether it was FDRT or whatever. And so it actually really helped us minimize the amount of toxicity. So I think that it really is a very exciting thing for the future. No, I 100% I agree. And I think it will also come down to will injection of immunotherapy versus cryoablation, where we also see that activation of the immune system, which one will be will be better and for whom. So I think it's exciting times, just like you said. I think that um, cancer care for lung cancer is going to be very different. Hey, Karen, this is uh, Jose Harasso, um, uh, Division Director of Home Crit. And, and first of all, you know, it, this was an excellent talk and, you know, I'm very proud of the work you, you do and, and our interventional pulmonologists do at TGH. Something that comes up frequently and, and I want you to touch on is, is, you know, skills, credentialing. You know, what what do you think is the future on, on dividing uh, what a normal pulmonary critical care physician can do in terms of procedures versus an, uh, an interventional pulmonary physician? I think that's a, a very hot topic of discussion. I think that as we see things move towards the ACGME accreditation, I think that is going to help delineate some of some of that those questions. I think there's always going to be those that are kind of grandfathered in. Um, but I think eventually we're going to be looking at metrics of of those that do these types of procedures, right? What are your diagnostic yields? What are your complication rates? And that's going to kind of tease that out itself. So those that may have um, extended their training or that, um, you know, do a higher volume may have different metrics. And that may be how hospitals uh, sort that out in the coming in the future. Yeah. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Right, everyone gets two minutes of time back today. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. It's the after hours SOPs with Cheryl Tuning. Thanks, Dr. Vanaki. Give us who's going to do chicken sandwich. Oh, oh, I can do that. Oh. Which card do you want me to put the CFR meeting registration on? That's a good 